undercover Phoenix police detectives were able to obtain a DNA sample from the suspect just last week. I need your full name and date of birth, please. Brian Patrick Miller. They say his pride and joy seemed to be this car, a police interceptor he bought and re-decaled to say Zombie Hunter. He took the Zombie Hunter to car shows, used it in photo shoots, and it was sometimes splattered with fake blood. He's with the people from The Walking Dead. It's that ironic, Walking Dead TV show. She was into The Walking Dead, like zombies. Was that something, was that, a, was that real? Yeah, yeah, we'd get together every Sunday night to watch the new episode. <laughs> he dressed in this zombie hunter kind of cyberpunk outfit. What was her interest in that? The storyline, it just really hooked us. Let's get to the point when you started thinking maybe he had something to do with Adrian Salinas's disappearance and murder. This is called Everett. And most of our people in Everett, especially historians, oh, we get riled up when we travel around the country, we say we're from Everett, Washington. Other people say, oh, Seattle area. No, we're from Everett. I've lived here all my life. I was born here in 1951, so 70 years now. This is probably one of the most beautiful locations of any city in the United States. We're surrounded by the water on three sides. There's a deep water port there. Well, certainly in the early 1900s, this was one rough town. You had 24 labor unions, you had two dozen sawmills, you had uh, strikes going on all the time, and there was, some, there was some bloodshed. What do most people now associate with Everett? I think uh, really outdoor opportunities, you know, recreation, and then of course the high employment at the Boeing company. Boeing builds its wide body airplanes here, just south of us up on the hillside. The assault happened just before school yesterday morning. The 14-year-old girl was apparently on her way to school at Cascade High School. Had you heard of any of these attacks before we reached out to you? Police say this violent crime against such a young victim appears to be a random attack. I honestly can't say they made the front page of our uh, local newspaper or not. I don't remember. 
It happened around 6 o'clock this morning as the 14-year-old victim walked the interurban trail in the Silver Lake area of Everett. Can I get you to say and spell your first and last name? Victoria Michelson. Tell me what this pathway meant to you. Did you ever come out here? Why did you come out here? I would walk this trail with my good friends in the summer between middle school and high school, and we would go swimming at Silver Lake. This was a fun, happy trail until that morning of October 9th in the year 2000. I remember that I could barely see the top of the power lines through all of the trees. I remember hearing the bang right when I was on the curve. You're on that curve on and the you see him behind you. Exactly. And then this is where he caught up to you? Yes, pretty much like right here. So he came up behind me, put his arm around my shoulders, cut my neck, and then I was struggling to get away from him. And then I turned and kicked my leg up in the air as tall as his head and I kicked the knife out of his hand like, like a karate kick. And it flew out of his hand and it flew like three feet down to the ground. He sees the knife he sees and you see the knife and you go for it. I go for it. I grab it, I grab it as hard as I can. And I'm like, there's no way. It, in my mind, I'm like, there's no way I'm gonna give him the knife back. Like, there's no way. But at the end of that one minute thought, I just thought to myself, I want this to be over, and I got to get to school. He said, if you give me the knife, I won't hurt you. So I gave him back the knife, and he then strangled me until I passed out. And then, well, he strangled me until I closed my eyes, and then he put my backpack under my head. I remember, I remember his hand lifting up my neck and the bottom of my head like it was careful, like it was a pillow or something. It was like he was using care, like he was posing you. Yeah. A man who walks the inner urban path saw someone flee from the area, um, found our victim seriously wounded um, on the ground on the inner urban trail and uh, called for aid. I was barely hanging on when the paramedics came. I remember them slapping my face at least 20 times to get me to wake up and try and give them any information that I could. Police tell Cairo 7 Eyewitness News their investigation focuses on a person who lived in a transient camp in the woods near the crime scene. That rest area back there is known for the transients and, and problems, and they jumped that fence and onto that trail, so it's not a good area. A man fled the scene, but so far, no arrests in connection with this crime. Do you think that he was still out there and he might try to find you? Yeah. I didn't know where he could possibly be. I knew he was still out there, and I know that they never found him. Friends and fellow students are now signing posters and collecting money for get well gifts. How difficult was your recovery? It was horrible. I had to have a nurse come to my house three times a day to change my bandages. I had three open wounds on my stomach. I couldn't eat right, I couldn't sleep right, I was in pain, I couldn't stand up straight. I couldn't stand up straight and I couldn't walk. Investigators now believe the attacker was not a transient, but rather a neighbor, somebody who lived just 100 yards away from Victoria. It all clicked. It all clicked. I'm like, it had to be somebody that was close to me, somebody that was close by somebody that was right under my nose. I know his face and I just don't understand why they couldn't find him. And he was right here.
When did the name Brian Patrick Miller cross your radar? When Phoenix police came up and said, this is who I think it is. Phoenix police came to you? Yes, five, five or six years ago. They came to you and they said, we think we know who attacked you? Yes. They showed me a picture of his uh, mugshot, and I was like, ooh, that's really creepy. He's got the same exact face, the same cheekbones, the same eye sockets, the same facial bones, the same structure. Is there any doubt in your mind that the person who attacked you was Brian Patrick Miller? No, not a single doubt, not a single doubt. On May 3rd, 2002, Everett police arrested Brian Miller after a 25-year-old woman claimed he attacked her with a knife. Hi there. I don't mean to bother you. I'm a news reporter. Were you the one who called police when Melissa Ruiz Ramirez showed up? She says that Melissa ran up to the door and she could tell that she was in extreme distress because she was screaming and, and scared, banging on the door, wanting help. trying to find. Okay. Okay. This quiet country home nestled on the Pilchuck River is a crime scene tonight. Investigators say the 37-year-old woman who lived here alone was last seen alive on Wednesday. What about this other case that you found? Kelly Jones Sarston, she was found dead in the river behind her home after having been reported missing. Authorities will not say how the woman died, but the coroner confirms it was murder. There's not a ton out there about this murder case. So we're hoping that family members might be able to shed some light on what happened. And we're driving about 40 miles north of Everett to talk to two of Kelly Jones Sarston's sisters. start with this question. Um, what's going through your, your heads right now as you knew that this interview was coming up? Uh, what's going through my head is uh, realizing how long it's been since Kelly died. Um, and the unfinished questions of who killed my sister. You know, when, the, when it happened, we never thought that it would take this long, ever. You know, I, I made a, a promise to Kelly that I would do whatever it took and would continue this as long as needed until her killer was found. Kelly was an ace of diamonds. She was bright, happy, energetic. Um, 
was always there for people when they needed her. Not long after high school, she went to beauty school mm -hmm. and um, became a beautician. Then she just kind of got tired of sitting around waiting for her next client to show up. Somebody had told her, you need to drive dump trucks. And so here's Kelly with this big blonde bombshell gal um, driving these dump trucks. And then she ended up getting her own dump truck and, and it was called Extreme Rock was her company, one truck. Did she like driving that dump truck? Did oh, yeah. she like that company? Oh yeah, especially when my dad would come see her. She thought that was the coolest thing to show my dad. What can you tell me about the day in 2004 that you heard the news that maybe she was missing? I was in Eastern Washington and um, I got a call in the morning and I knew my mom doesn't call that early when I, she knows I'm away. And she just told me that something happened and Kelly's missing and I just lost it. When did you find out that, that she had been murdered? I knew it from the beginning. I knew it from the beginning when we were standing there, um, you know, in the neighbor's yard looking over, um, looking over the river there. I just knew what they were doing was not looking for, you know, just a, a missing person. This morning, deputies found a body matching her description in the ankle deep water along the river's edge. They established that it's a murder and you expect somebody to be arrested immediately. In a perfect world, yes. How does it affect the people left behind when a case is not solved? Well, it's kind of a cliche to say that we didn't get closure. But it's the easiest way to say it. It's just, it's, it's just so maddening that whoever did it has been free for this long. They, they killed a vital person in this world who had plans in life. They killed my sister. They took her away from her family and her friends. And, and they're out there free. It's not fair. The MO's definitely similar. But was he here? I don't know. Investigators have told us that they don't believe that Miller was responsible for your sister's death, but you still think it's important to come forward and talk about this case. Why is that? Why is it important? Because we don't want it to get forgotten. And we want people to, to know that we're still looking. And because they could be wrong. It could be. Who knows? Three cases in the Everett area. In one, we know Miller was the attacker. In the second, the victim believes the attacker was Miller. In the third case, investigators say probably not. Now our challenge is to look for similarities between these cases and Adrian Salinas's case because ultimately we want to know if Miller was her killer. We know Brian Miller lived here for a couple of years at least. Is there anybody left in this community who he has any attachment to? Well, I know in his bail review hearing, they talked about ties to the community and his grandmother who lived here, his mom and his stepdad who just lived down the street. His mom has passed, but maybe there's a chance his stepdad's still around. We've got an address 
How do we know he's at that address? Well, we don't know if he's still there, but it's the most recent address I could find for him. I'm looking for James Flores. My name's Morgan Lowe, and I'm an investigative reporter with a TV station in Phoenix. What did I ask him about his stepson? Are you James? I am. Okay. He didn't know him that well. He said, you know, as Mello, there's nothing that he ever did that I would have thought would make him connected. I had no, he didn't know, he didn't know anything about Brian's history in Arizona. Um, but he said he, he, he had no indication that Brian could be capable of what he's accused of. Doesn't know whether he's guilty of what he's accused of. Let's get to the point when you started thinking maybe he had something to do with Adrian Salinas's disappearance and murder. Was there anything that caught your attention early on that said, this is worth looking into? Besides the fact that he knew the Superstition Mountains like the back of his hand. If I'm not mistaken, he actually was fond of racing his cars around the area, you know. Was there anything about his behavior leading up to that week that caught your attention? Well, not at the time, but looking back in retrospect, sure. He had a very bad anxiety attack during that time. It was, uh, he, he, to the point where he couldn't sleep. He was, he was waking up crying, you know. Uh, this is from his own admission, you know. He was spiraling that week. He was. I mean, I thought I saw it as just another episode. Do you know where his whereabouts were that night? The, the 15th? Yeah. That night of the 14th and morning of the 15th. I had to go back and dig through social media to find out, and apparently it was Tempe. Did he drive around at night? During that Father's Day, or close to it, he was doing a lot of biking, and he was doing a lot of sunrise, pre-sunrise biking. Have you been able to rule Brian Patrick Miller out? No. Do you have any evidence that suggests it's him? No, not any direct evidence. Uh, if, if anything, it would all be circumstantial things, like we discussed of him being in the area, having some ties, not a lot of ties to where her body was located, but he has done some cosplay out there and done some other things. Did you hope to be able to interview him about this? Yes. And did you try? Yeah, so um, he was interviewed on another case. And after that case, uh, his attorneys made it clear that they didn't want him interviewed, being interviewed on any other cases. You think there's a realistic possibility that it is Brian Miller? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, somebody capable of murder in the neighborhood, yeah, absolutely.